And then next, after this panel, is a panel discussion on taking that technology to Africa. So a real uh, solid combination over these last three sessions. If I could ask my panel members to come up to the stage, we'll get started with this session. And what I will do first is introduce the panel um, and ask the panel members to briefly describe their business or their activity. And um, this is a different um, uh, segment of agriculture, food, and investment or technology. And um, we bring, I hope, excitement, energy, motivation, passion, all those things. So they're going to describe their business in less than one minute. This is going to be fast paced and we're going to try and keep uh, the energy level high. So um, first is Ponzi Travis Vivette. She uh, has had a long career at uh, Syngenta uh, and then uh, Indigo, but currently is CEO of Inari. Describe Inari, please. Uh, thanks, Paul. So um, we are essentially a plant breeding company and our intention is really to disrupt the seed industry. Um, through our technologies as well as the business model. Um, so the question that we ask is actually, how do we reintroduce the genetic diversity back to the crop in order to address the winning food system? So what we are doing is not asking about a question of how do we feed 9 billion people by 2050? For us, the question is, how do we actually do it without starving the planet? So essentially, uh, where we are right now, um, we have roughly 65 people, 55 of us are scientists um, across um, backgrounds, whether that would be medical research applying to agriculture or from academia. Um, we are based out of Cambridge um, in Massachusetts. Um, we also have operations in Indiana, as well as in Ghent, Belgium. So that's roughly about Inari. Thanks, Ponzi. And I should have said, Ponzi's uh, educational background, uh, she has an MBA from Cornell University. Next to my left is Tom Loretta. Uh, he is uh, CEO of Newly Symbiotics. Um, his educational background is uh, degrees from Brown University and Yale, and a PhD in political economy from RPFU. I don't know what that is, but it's in Moscow, and that's part of Tom's unique career. Tom, what's New Leaf? That's all you need to know is that it's in Moscow. <clears throat> so New Leaf Symbiotics is a microbial discovery commercialization company based in St. Louis, Missouri. So we are one of the companies at the forefront of trying to understand how plant-based microbes or soybeans microbes can change agriculture in a sustainable way. Our focus is on one particular type of microbe, so we're the world leaders in understanding how this microbe, this microbial family lives with plants, what the symbiosis is or are, because there are thousands, of course, of different strains, and turning these into useful products for farmers. We introduced our first two products in the U.S. this year, one in soybean and one in peanut. We'll be introducing two more for the following season. Uh, so we're in a very exciting space, as I think everyone up here is, and uh, very happy to be part of this panel. Thanks, Tom. And to Tom's left is Karsten Tim, uh, CEO of Pivot Bio. We've heard a lot about microbes already today. Tom just said it. Now we've got more microbes at, with uh, Karsten. But Karsten's background is um, a bachelor's degree from the University of Iowa and then a PhD from University of Cal Berkeley. Karsten, what's your business? Well, hi, everyone. I my vision is based on bringing better efficiency and resiliency to our farmers. And Liam did a great job highlighting the, the hope of having a nitrogen-fixing microbe for corn or other cereal crops. And I, I'm proud that my team launched the world's first product that can fix and supply nitrogen to corn just last week. And, and we really are leveraging a, a new uh, insight into the crop's own microbiome for fixing nitrogen. And it's completely changing the way we think about managing nitrogen in the field. 
So uh, for us, one of our core values is we'd like to inspire each other. And I think a lot of my uh, fellow members on the stage here inspire us. Great. And of course, uh, we've got a lot of excitement in the startup community, but we need uh, someone, many people, to fund it, all these great ideas and great uh, people. And that's Lucas Mann, uh, partner with Acre Venture Partners. Tell us a little bit more about your fund. Uh, so I'm lacking advanced degrees in microbes, so I hope you'll bear with me uh, on the panel here. But uh, my name is Lucas Mann. I'm a co-founder of Acre Venture Partners. Uh, it's a, a venture fund based in California who's focused on food system investing. Uh, we put together um, a unique alchemy, we believe, because as lots of folks in this room know, these days it's quite vogue to be an investor in um, food and agriculture businesses. So we wanted to anchor that into practical and pragmatic experience. So. Um, as a group of partners, we come from uh, operating agriculture, uh, large-scale consumer packaged good companies, um, and some White House policy. Uh, and so we do that in a model of collaborative disruption uh, with the, the big players. Okay. And Lucas has a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Santa Barbara. So a great panel here. Um, and what I'd like to start with is to hear from each of the four about where we've come from, uh, you know, clearly there's a lot of interest in startups, a lot of activity, a lot of new money. And also, as I look at this uh, field, I'm also seeing new players come in as fund uh, behind the funds, you know, even things like Google, Amazon, others that aren't traditionally in agriculture, but entering agriculture. So bring us a little perspective on what has uh, transpired over the last 10 years in ag tech to create where we are today, this excitement around agricultural technology. Karsten, would you go first? Sure, I, I think it boils down to three things. Uh, one of those is that we have a confluence of a lot of new technologies that's highlighted very frequently across the last few days, but it, it pairs really well with a, a growing interest among investors to, to branch outside of some of the, the traditional spaces. And it's a reflection of, of new money being available. Uh, but fundamentally, we have uh, a new set of challenges uh, that consumers care about. And, and the, the thing that I think we've seen is uh, a lot of industry has been consolidating across the last, last decade and innovation has the potential to come from somewhere new. Uh, that effort of looking for a way to deploy capital efficiency is now kind of shifting towards some of the, the smaller companies or, or new ideas popping up from places around the globe. And Lucas, you even mentioned in your comments that this space is uh, in vogue now. So what's causing it to create this excitement and bring new investors in? Well, so we look at it from a food system perspective, which obviously dovetails into agriculture. But when you look at this set of emerging technologies and direct consumer channels and the, uh, you know, kind of rise of opportunity, uh, folks that don't have a sort of grounding in agriculture um, come and expect what we would refer to as venture style returns. So, you know, things that are traditionally capital intensive and duration is a problem, you know, these things, um, they take time and capital and expertise. And so uh, one of the things that, that we really focus on is you know, how do you pragmatically root uh, you know, the capital to what's possible and what's true, evidence and science and those kinds of things. But more importantly, in, in this moment where you can do all of these things, it doesn't mean that you should, uh, and it doesn't mean that they will be adopted. And so how do you have a deep enough understanding of the whole supply chain and the whole value chain to understand what things are possible from a customer perspective and a consumer perspective? Ponzi, what would you add? Um, I'll, I'll add one thing, just the observation around the investors. Um, it is true that um, it is about innovation, but um, from my experience um, over the past two years coming into this um, world of startups more, and it's quite encouraging that whether we like it or not, all of these investors ask the first question around what are you helping in terms of the challenge of the food security? 
right? Actually, that's the first question before the innovation. And we started to actually see the quality of those investors a lot more, um, whether that would be the family funds. Um, it has to come first that you can prove you can actually create something around a winning food system. You can create something around the sustainability. So that actually helps more and more that the money that comes in don't actually come from only about the high tech, but also the people who have the willingness to actually address the challenge of the food security. Great. And, and Tom, what I'd like you to speak about is um, changing the topic a little bit about going forward. Karsten just mentioned consolidation, and that's one change that is occurring now, but also technologies are changing. Um, consumer trends are changing. Um, environmental issues are becoming more and more important. And then if you look at the public arena, many institutions, whether they be research organizations, government organizations, academia, are being squeezed for funding. So you got consolidation, consumer trends, public funding maybe being being come a little bit more tougher to get. And my sense is, we just had a review of the past, but if you look to the future, my sense is we've got a bit of a sea change going on right now with all of these um, combining changes occurring at the same time. What does that hold for startups? How can you take advantage of that or how can you prepare for that sea change that seems to be occurring. <clears throat> yeah, first of all, I agree with my fellow panelists that, I mean, we're really in a disruptive moment, and this has been a, a very encouraging, from my point of view, series of conversations, including what Liam and Rob talked about today and Jim Collins yesterday in terms of companies recognizing we can't just be an ag input company. We are really being driven by what consumers one, and we see this, I mean, you, the big companies see this all the time, but we see it even more closely because that is what's driving in, in the investment thesis for many, many companies. Um, in, in terms of where we're headed next, I mean, there, there's not only disruption in the social environment, and we don't only face these problems of feeding the world, but I think that technologies are now becoming very fluid. Uh, the whole opportunity around the microbiome in both human health and in, in, in plant health has, has become obvious, I think, to people. You know, there's an expression that if everybody knows it's a good idea, who needs you? And, you know, I think that companies like ours really do have to be at the, at the leading forefront of recognizing these trends first and understanding the environment within which we're operating, big ag, but also lots of other players in agriculture. So I think the real moment for disruption is now, and that's what's driving, I think, all the interest you're seeing in, in some of these smaller venture companies. And, and I'll, build, I'll build on that and say the, the word disruption is a great way to look at it because I think, like Ponzi mentioned, a lot of our investors will ask us about impact, <clears throat> but impact is also uh, really a question in two ways. It's not just impact on our ability to literally clean up the planet, but there's a potential that power could begin to shift in the industry that some new companies that have just gotten created in the last few years might begin to be the source of trust for growers around the world or be the source of advice that growers really turn to. And, and that could change the way our industries work. So the, the power of new ideas is, is what a lot of these investors get excited about and are really investing in. And it, it's, it's a bet that maybe in a decade, the, the kind of transformational impact any of our companies might have is, is much bigger than any of us imagine right now. Right. It's quite interesting to actually be in this um, community as well, because um, in fact, we kind of knew each other from um, um, the past before. Um, and also it's, it's the environment whereby you encourage one another and you want to bring in more startups, you, we invite competition, and that's how we see it. We want to see more startups, we want to see new ideas, and even people to build on our new, new ideas, because um, that's the community that um, we actually get together for quite a bit among ourselves in terms of startups, and I think that's the kind of healthy dynamic that we see at the moment. So investors, um, you know, are they anticipating or feeling this change, you know, consolidation, 
uh, limited research uh, coming from public institutions, consumer trends. What do you hear or see from investors, Lucas? I can tell you what I think. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things that we talk about a lot, we sort of jokingly call it the 3G effect, which is that y you have this, um, certainly in the agriculture business, consolidation provides opportunity, but when you look at the food business, you look at innovation, which typically, you know, you need long timelines for, and you need protected capital that doesn't get interrupted. So, you know, iteration and product line extension get, you know, sort of sold as innovation. Uh, real and true innovation typically happens outside those companies, certainly true for the food companies. And so when we start to see folks that have deep working knowledge of these companies, and Ponzi and her team are a great example, um, you know, as an investor, and I am an investor in Ponzi's company, a lot of that's to do with the team that she's assembled. These are people that have careers, decade-spanning careers that understand these systems deeply and are now able to come out, utilize these technologies, and be collaborative or disruptive, whatever they decide to do, whatever their approach may be, uh, the knowledge base is extraordinary, and that's new. I could just add to that, we jokingly say that we're, that the team in, in our company are refugees from Monsanto and Bayer and BASF in a positive way, uh, more like uh, we've been incubated through these companies, but I think the, the, the opportunity for companies like ours that are really innovating in a space who also understand how, in fact, real agriculture works, what the large companies can and cannot do, and how those resources can be more properly aligned. That's a big part of, of the opportunity, and, and I think you're seeing that in many of the uh, startups. And, and there is a lot of cross-pollination across industries because of the, the nature of businesses we run, that we're not just hiring a leadership team that, that has had a, uh, uh, decades of experience within the industry here today, but we're attracting folks who worked at Google or Facebook and, and they no longer want to program an app from your phone. They want to do something more meaningful. And when you get people with the most advanced degrees on the cutting edge of science together with folks who have seen firsthand what challenges within the industry are like, and you can take everybody out to a field and meet with growers, a lot of ideas bubble up that, that you might never imagine are potential solutions to these problems. Just to add just one, one little thing. I, I think one of the things that's really important as we go forward is that as more capital comes into the space, and there's plenty of that, this domain expertise is really important. So we do quite a bit of investing with the Googles and the mainline kind of investors, um, and, and they're incredibly helpful uh, on the things that they understand well. As we go forward, what's really important, I think, and this is no secret to f people in this room, I mean, there's tons of domain expertise and lots of investors that have been doing this for a, quite a long time. But as, um, you know, as new capital comes in, things suffer, meaning valuations suffer. They get pushed up for things that are possible or not. And so this you know, very kind of pragmatic approach, I think, uh, which is anchored in understanding, becomes more important as more capital comes in. Okay, so we're, just, just a second, Ponzi, I'm gonna come right to you with a related question on this. Um, but it's interesting, the conversation has shifted a bit uh, to, to talent and the people. You know, Tom made the comment about people coming from the majors into startups, um, talent acquisition and so on. Um, I've been re retired now, uh, coming up on two years, and I am being more active in the startup community, in the venture capital fund, and I find it exciting. And when I had the chance to lead this panel, I thought, okay, what do I want out of it? And this is what I wrote down. How do we get people to want to work for a startup? Um, how do we get organizations to want to partner with a startup? Or how do we get uh, young people to want to start a startup? So Ponzi, you're a refugee from Syngenta. <laughs> um, talk about talent a little bit and how to get that excitement of either working with a startup, getting young people to start a startup, uh, how do you create that excitement with the business that you're in? Sure. Yeah, I was going to address that point. Um, as, as a startup, um, you don't focus only on technology, and I come back again, we focus on impact, right? So impact plus technology together. And um, because of the level of risk tolerance for us is higher, um, so we actually, when you have combination of impact and the risk tolerance, 
we actually can attract and we are willing to actually get the people to come in and we can attract the people not only from the industry and purposely for us, we look for the people outside of the ag industry as well. I'll give you a flavor that out of 65 people that we have, 55 are scientists, one third are actually from medical research, one third are actually academia. Um, some of them have never looked at plant before and the other third are, are actually agriculture. And the first two category, we are able to attract because of the impact that we are trying to make. And um, whether we like it or not, um, actually majority of our breakthroughs so far are actually coming from the one and two category. Mm -hmm. um, by having the category three to actually coach along the way, and then get the real breakthrough out of other things as well. So I would say, Paul, um, essentially, if you want to simplify it, it's around make sure that it's not only about technology, but it's also about the purpose and the impact. Yeah. And I, Tom. Or, 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 you guys will fight over it. Yeah, go for it. I'll, I'll follow up. Um, I, would, I would add that I've done this several times, and I find the startup environment extremely exhilarating because uh, you are facing all the challenges that Ponzi just named, plus you have a, a, a limited team, a limited resource, and a big idea that you've got to get to. So your advantage over you know, a company that can just throw 50 or 100 million dollars at something is you've got to be more nimble and you've got to be more clever about how you are dealing with all the data coming at you, both from your own data set, the environment around you, um, so it's also quite a challenge as you grow, you need people from various walks of life, who have various skill sets, and then you need to transform that entire company, that entire group, as, as the, the opportunity grows and as, as you get to be a more mature company. So I, I would also say that it's really great to see all these young people here, all the students who've been, I don't know how many are in the room right now, but don't be afraid of a startup if, if that's where your heart lies. I would say that, um, it's a very exciting area. You can attract great people. You can attract people from industry who have done well and are now saying, I'd really like to, to see this other aspect of myself. So the team is, I mean, when, when we talk with investors, that is always the number one factor for investors in venture, at least from my experience. Can this team learn from what they're doing? Can they grow through whatever challenges they're gonna be? And are they going to figure it out? Because it ain't all figured out from day one. Yeah, that's a good point. It, you know, the day-to-day -day may not be that different from a lot of jobs, but the, the word that doesn't exist for us is impossibility. Because we are trying to set our sights so high, the, the problem we're, we're solving seems impossible. I mean, for our company, we're going after building products that fix nitrogen for cereals. That's been impossible for 125 years until now. And the solution is, is not a linear solution. It's nonlinear because it takes people with different experiences to build something new together. And, and the day-to-day -day is about taking any little problem and figuring out a way to build around it, whether it's just figuring out how we work on a daily basis and, and how we eliminate unnecessary meetings and you know, all the minutia of, of work life that we all experience, or saying there, there's 50 years of institutional academic knowledge to build on if we just piece it together the right way and we can build a transformative product. So I think in any of our companies, the more we can find people who want to build and don't consider anything to be impossible, that's, that's a great reason to come looking to join a company like ours. Well, one, one thing I just want to add, which is, is to some of the folks in this room, as you look at these three companies in particular, you'll find that, that they are startups. Yes, startup is a, is a very narrowly, <laughs> broadly defined word in this case. These are very well-funded startups. But I'm sure they all started with an idea. And with this rise of technology and people have intention, for us, for example, my fund is totally focused on human health. So you can create these outcomes because you have these technologies and you have this institutional knowledge, but that starts with just one person. And so while we refer to startups in this case as being you know, incredibly well-funded, that wasn't always true. And I think that's important to bring energy and continued kind of innovation to the space. 
I'm going to just pause here for a moment. Uh, we've got about 15, 20 minutes left. And I'm going to try and save the last five or 10 minutes for questions from the audience. So you might be thinking of that now. So when we come to that uh, time period, you've got a question uh, ready. So be prepared. Um, OK, so we've heard a lot of enthusiasm. Um, money's coming in. New players are coming in. Talents are coming in. Ag tech, uh, a lot of new ideas. All that sounds good. But what are the challenges? And Lucas, I'm going to look to you first because you're dealing with the investors. You need to sell people that they need to be thinking of this as a viable space. So you've got challenges, you know, um, great ideas, uh, but you've still got to work through the proof of concept stage. You've got to take an idea to the market. You need to take your idea and generate money. What are the challenges from an investor standpoint when you look at funding startups? Sure. So, so I think the increased interest in this space is actually a double-edged sword. So certainly it provides more opportunity, but it also, uh, again, we keep going back to this idea of expertise. But uh, you know, unless, unless there's a real understanding between the investors and the company on what's possible, you're going to get into a mismatch straight away. And that becomes a fatal problem in, in, in most cases. So I think having a true understanding of who you're in business with and what that's going to mean over time, and I'm sure there's real stories here from these three and, and other folks in the room, uh, I, I find that to be challenging. The other thing is as more people, uh, I come from startups and that's all I've ever done. So I know that world, it makes sense to me. I, I, risk is fine. Uh, it's a whole different thing as, as you know, some of you guys, I think Carson, that's what you've always done, but you know, it's different. There is no net, especially in the beginning. And so that um, ability to leap, uh, sometimes I believe that's an innate ability. It's not learned. Um, and so that kind of real understanding of what you're getting yourself into, uh, I think, matters. And, and you can see straight away who's hesitating and who's not. And that's a, that's a, a big point of difference. Okay, Ponzi challenge that you think uh, mm -hmm. sitting in your business uh, for the future. What are you worried about? Um, the challenge is actually how how do I stay super laser focused um, in a way that we don't have unlimited resources um, and with the team and the ideas um, and the technologies that we have, they're just so applicable to a lot of things. The question is, how do we actually make sure that we go about just this idea for now, um, this geography for now, these crops for now? So for me, it's, it's how do you do it in a way that you don't bring down the whole excitement of the team? So that's something that it's, um, as a CEO, I'm, I'm, I'm facing that for quite a bit. Um, but it's exciting. Yeah, I knew Paul was going to come up with a trick question because right. there really are no challenges. No, okay. I mean, not so far. It even makes run across. It more attractive for yeah. all the people we're trying <laughs> right. to attract to this space. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think Ponzi, that's a great point. Focus in our company, our chief investor calls it puppy drowning, meaning you've got all these cute puppies. If you try to feed them all, they're all going to die. So you're going and they're all good. But you're going to have to drown some. I know that's a little kind of a, a harsh <laughs> reality, but I didn't make it up, right? I've just been told that Tom, you got to drown puppies. Um, I would say one of the, the challenges is the alignment of the new data and the new learnings that are coming out of what we're working with in an environment. So we're all startup companies or well-funded startup companies, but we're living in an environment that is really changing fast. And you raised earlier, Paul, all the uh, M&A activity going on in the industry. Access to the market is, is highly affected by that. So the alignment of not only which puppy do you drown, but how do you make sure the ones you haven't drowned are progressing at, at, at a rate that corresponds to the, the bigger opportunity around you? I, th I think that's really a, uh, it is a challenge to sort of calculate that and to make sure your team understands it. Because, I mean, one of the key factors in the success of a company like ours is making sure the team is good, but also is motivated, understands the strategy, and is working to fulfill that strategy. So. Um, I would say that alignment is, is a challenge that we face. And, and the one thing I'll add that I, I think has been hinted at but not mentioned is speed. And speed plays out in, in three ways. Uh, for me, almost 15 years ago, I left Iowa to go out to California to cut my teeth in the field of synthetic biology. And, 
And I, I studied for my PhD on nitrogen fixation. So I've, I've been working on building a solution for nitrogen fixing cereals for almost 15 years. And, and it's been a consistent sprint marathon because one, the, the problems that nitrogen fixing cereals can help solve impact us on such rapid timelines. We need a, a solution now. The second is the only advantage I have over any big incumbent out there and the only way I'm gonna stay alive is to move faster than them. And I can make decisions faster with my team. I can decide to bring new technologies together faster than anybody else can. And then the other challenge though is in the face of competition, you know, when other people see what we do and they decide they wanna get into the space, we have to continue to execute and, and not just make promises, but deliver on them. So hold up our end of the bargain to farmers, hold up our end of the bargain to our investors and to each other that, that we can continue to execute. So speed is the name of the game in, in a startup and an emerging company. And it's really the one advantage you have over anybody else who, who might be in a similar business. Okay. You're all Good. an overnight success, all of you. Right? right. Also, it's, it's hard to see why investors get a bad rap when they talk about puppy drowning. <laughs> we don't need any help being disliked, so that's not great. That's the nicest thing. <laughs> said. So, yeah. so let's see what uh, questions there might be from the audience. Uh, one over here. Go ahead. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you. It's a very uh, interesting uh, presentation. Um, my question is, uh, throughout this session, I've heard the word innovation used a lot. And I actually am uh, with financial services and human-centered design and design-led experiences. And I'm curious, if you were to each of the panelists, maybe one to three words, if you were forced to not use the word innovation, what word or words would you choose? Good. Okay. Okay, uh, go. Quick. This is lightning round. Teamwork. Make your idea bigger. Focus. And then innovation will come from that. <laughs> Innovation. That's, what you say. That's my answer. <laughs> my, mine are both collaboration and disruption. Okay. We're going to come back to disruption in a moment. Um, go ahead. Hi, Leah Lucas. I'm with TechnoServe Mozambique. And Lucas, you mentioned taking a leap. So I wanted to ask, I know there's no cookie cutter solution and every story is different, but what would be three to five key principles or things to have in place before taking that leap? So kind of non-negotiables for a promising startup. Thank you. It's a, it's a great question. And I can only answer from my personal experience as an entrepreneur, which is what my, my training is. And the only way I can describe it is that, that, and my partners pick on me for this, is I jump without looking every time and I put the airplane together on the way down. And that's the only thing I know how to do. And so that's sort of in my DNA. Uh, so I couldn't really give you, a, I'm sure somebody can give you a great answer, but I've never spent a lot of time thinking about it before I've jumped. It's a gut thing. My, my, my answer is, ask yourself a question, if, if I don't do this, how long will it be till somebody else does? Okay, we're going to jump to the other side of the room. I mentioned that I had some objectives when I um, took the responsibility of leading the panel, panel and they're right over here. Uh, we've got young people waiting in line. Um, and women, young women who are going to make a difference in the world. So go ahead. Yes. Um, my name is Katarina Schmidt. I'm with the Global Youth Institute. We're all over here. Um, you mentioned the solution about creating nitrogen fixing corn, and I suppose it's through synthetic biology. I'm really interested in synthetic biology, and I'm wondering if that's a solution that can be applied to like other using those microorganisms that you've modified to be able to fix that nitrogen in other like cereals, I guess you're working on that, and how like reliable that is, because synthetic biology as a field is really unpredictable. Okay, perfect setup for great, great question. I, let's not answer a lot of that right now, because okay. I, the answer is we've, we're trying to work with every crop out there that could okay. benefit from the technology. I, the goal is to make something that is resilient for a farmer to use has to work really well and leave them with a better outcome than without it. Okay. Uh, but I think there's probably a lot of folks who would like to continue a conversation with all of us. So let's take a minute and, and maybe just give a good way to connect with each company. And then after this, maybe we can find some place uh, on the side and anybody can come talk to us even more. It's so like right outside. Um, okay. Julie, what's the name of that room? 
Sioux City? Okay. The Sioux City room. Let's meet there. Anybody who wants Great. to continue the conversation. Great. So we'll but make for that, we'll make that point and we'll reinforce it at the close again. Sounds good. Okay, good. Uh, next over here. Hey, my name is Zelfa. I'm a student at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, and I love the way that you talked about the youth being involved and the fact that you say that it's a matter of God and you. If you don't do it, then how long until somebody does it? But my question now is, how do you get around that period that you are not necessarily that informed or you don't have that much knowledge and you're not even that financially stable to be able to pay those experts, but you have an idea and you want to do it? Thank you. Can I start? Because I have, um, I'm the youngest person up here. You probably noticed that. Uh, <laughs> I said to Paul, are you sure you, know, you want to call this the panel of the young, just starting out? Um, so I have kids as, as well. And I would say, you're, you're doing it. I was so impressed <clears throat> with the openness and the questions that I heard during lunch from some of the students who were there. So this is what you got to do. You got to be not afraid to ask that question and stand up and, and pursue. So there's no one answer, and I'm sure my colleagues would agree. Um, but if you keep that attitude of life and that attitude of curiosity, it's going to lead you to opportunities. That's kind of the whole idea of this approach, of the venture approach. Don't, don't be afraid about making mistakes. Like the, the best thing you can do <clears throat> is ask a question and, and realize that your assumption was wrong because then you learn something new. Yeah, the, the most important thing is you're going to need to actually feel comfortable with admitting that you can't do it and then move on quickly. Mm -hmm. So the quick decision is the key part of making the startup happen. Failure is good. I would actually, failure is good. We actually celebrate the failure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. As the oldest person here, I would say that, that a contrarian point of view actually is important. And in some ways, a less educated point of view can be contrarian because you don't know what are the limits. And so great entrepreneurs don't see the limits between them and the goal while the rest of folks do. That's really important. In fact, the most successful company that we've been involved in, everyone that knew anything about agriculture said has no chance. I won't say what it is because I don't want to get thrown out of here. Okay, we've got time for two more questions. So the young lady here, and then we'll go back to this side of the room. Okay, so I'm Rachel. I'm from the Youth Institute. And I want to know, what is everything you guys wanted to do happening? Or is everything like you had bumps in the road and things like that? Are you like leading up to really what you guys wanted to do in the beginning? Great question. Uh, isn't everything just want, working perfectly? No bumps in the road at all. <laughs> Wait, uh, Tom. <laughs> yeah, a couple of bumps. Um, <laughs> the, you know, I, I think the, the point is what, if you just have a goal, I'm going to do this and make this product at this time, that's probably not going to happen. What's, what, what is happening, at least in our case, is we've got great ideas, we've got great support, including investors and board members, and a great team. So we're actually discovering what that goal is as we go along. Obviously, you have to have some, some direction, but if you're not open, if you just say, well, I gotta do this, and if I don't do this, I've failed, you're gonna fail, because nothing is gonna go exactly as you planned. Nothing in my life ever has. So, so I, I found it differently, actually, working for a startup, what you need to have is the vision, and then six months plan. <clears throat> don't, don't go for a five year plan, three years plan, because you're gonna figure out that within six months, you find something new that you never thought about it before. And it's actually even more exciting than that. As long as it's aligned with the vision, that's what's important, yeah. Okay, last question, thank you. Thank you. My name is Mark G, I'm a student at Purdue University. I was wondering, how do you share your vision without losing your competitive advantage? Hmm. Yeah. Somebody well, asked Ponzi. Um, there's, there's actually uh, probably a lot more people who will think you're crazy than want to copy your vision. And if you're doing it right. Yeah, and and there's a you know there's a way to talk about what your vision is without having to talk about the details of your technology, and 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 that balance is something that uh, you can protect with. NDAs or different types of things, the, the time when you need to get into the details. But really being able to motivate people talking about the vision is, is something that I, I think you'll find to your advantage more often than it would come back to harm you. Uh, um, 
I'll, I'll, I'll answer that question because if you go to Inari, um, I'm not sure whether you understand everything. So um, basically what, what we do is um, we essentially communicate um, why we do it and then what we do it. We essentially don't talk about how we do it. Um, we are happy to talk about that um, in the le high level. Um, what's important is how, how do you go about it and who are the audience? You just have to make sure that the communication is um, creative enough and there's no one size fit all. So um, you have to have new way of communicating and for us, Julie Bollock is leading our communication team here and has done a fantastic job that there's no one size fits all and it has to be different and has to be purposeful. Yeah. Not, not to be a party pooper, but I would add that in our case, we did stay under, under the covers for a while until we had established some IP. So mm -hmm. IP, intellectual property protection, is clearly part of that. As your vision evolves and grows, you do need to protect your ideas. And then I, I think there is a stage at which you get, I mean, in our case, it's taken us five years and $50 million to do what we've done. So is Bear or you know, some huge company going to say, well, let's just copy that. Here's 50 million bucks, come back in five years. You know, that's not gonna happen. So you, can't, you eventually have to get to a stage where you are able to talk about what you've learned, what you own, and uh, you, you have some protection for it. I don't know if that answers it. Okay, we're gonna wind down here, and I'm gonna ask each of the four to, Lucas, you have something burning well, to say. As long as there's one more opportunity yes. to say one okay. thing, then. <laughs> Um, so we're going to go through a real rapid round here, and um, you know this is exciting. C clearly, we're talking about microbes, plant health, plant vigor, um, channel disruption, uh, nitrogen utilization, digital application to solve every problem in the world, and of course, all these technologies and ideas are going to work 100%. You know, no doubt about it. So when they do work 100%, tell me in your mind. What is agriculture and food going to look like 10 years from now, given the success that you are all going to drive over that next period of 10 years? So, Lucas, you're a little bit more prepared because you were anxious to get going, so I you go first. I want to talk to the Youth Institute, so I'm not prepared, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, for me, it, it, it's, it's about how do, you, how do you affect populations in a meaningful way? How do we leverage these technologies that allow us not just to feed people, but to feed people well? I believe we'll have opportunity to create therapies that are delivered through food. And the breakthroughs that we're seeing now are the beginning, or maybe the continuation of that. Um, and just so I don't lose, the, the one thing I just wanted to say to the Youth Institute is that this room has an incredible amount of knowledge in it, and that means there's an incredible amount of learning and opportunity but don't let any barriers come between you and what you want to do. Learn from everybody here and find what your opportunities are, but don't be limited by anything that you see. Carson. So uh, my 10-year vision is that when you plant a seed, a microbe comes with it. That means you don't have to make additional efforts to fertilize a field. And that's something that my team will deliver on for corn, wheat, and rice across the next decade. So all of those times you'd drive a tractor or you'd try to figure out how to manage and predict the weather so that that fertilizer doesn't wash away, that will go away. My ask where I need help is thinking about how to translate what might work for a corn farmer down the road uh, outside of Des Moines to other parts of the world, to other cropping systems, to other ways of managing fertilizer in, in different uh, local markets, and how to get product to all the farmers of the world. So anybody who wants to help us move to other geographies, you know, come find me. And uh, you can always send me an email. It's karsten at pivotbio.com. And then you know, we'll be outside afterwards. So I think 10 years from now, uh, our goal, and I think probably it's broader than just our company, is that it will be obvious that, of course, the microbiome is part of the entire cropping system. It's part of how you do, how agriculture is conducted in a way that's not obvious today. The same with digital, by, by the way, which I think is happening more quickly. Um, so I think that does begin to transform the way we look at agriculture and the, the way we look at the opportunities 
in front of us. Um, I also think that the major companies will still be there and there will still be synthetic chemicals being used, but I think that we will be finding real opportunities to change the balance and the way that, that these chemicals are applied. So um, for me, is I hope there's no ending. Um, there's no such a thing that we said, we're gonna get here and then that's done. But at the minimum, um, I hope that we will get to the word that you, you heard me say, winning food system. And in that definition, it means that it's not only about productivity, but when we as Inari can do the plant breeding to create the seeds that are much more resilient to climate change, which is the real life, um, can get the seeds that could bring down the chemical usage, to get the seeds that could create the healthy food, and more importantly is how do we actually get the profitability of the farmers to go much, much higher than today? So that's when I would actually define it as when, when the winning food system started to have the clock running around it and continue to have that. Great. Great. Okay, thanks to each of you for your contributions today, but more importantly to your commitment to change and uh, grow this industry. Thank you very much.